Amen. Um, is there any prayer requests that anyone has for anybody or themselves? <clears throat> if not, we can pray. Let's uh, stand, those that can. And dear God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather here and the blessedness of hearing your word and hearing the brothers expound on it. God, I pray that this could be received with fruitful hearts and a ground that is prepared. Help us to understand to uh, not do things for vain glory or to be seen of men even if it's something good. Help us to be unworthy servants, only doing our duty. Pray now for the rest of this time that it could be edifying and that it could uh, build each one of us up where we're at in our lives, young and old. Just Give us, give us your word. Give us your understanding. Be with those that are sick. Pray for healing on their bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> yeah, I want to just... Um, Say whatever would build on to what has been what has been brought out already. It's been quite a blessing. I sure don't want to take anything away. Um, again, just if we, I think what I could get out of it is anything we do for vain glory, we have our reward already, and that's that's the end of it. We should be, well, there is a reward in heaven that we will receive. That's a promise, but we shouldn't be having, it, having or looking for it with any selfish motive. Um, what I want to talk about this morning uh, is, uh, well, first maybe we'll read the scriptures in Matthew 12, starting verse 38. <clears throat> what I want to get out of this is um, something that's very important to talk about all the time. And it's important to, to uh, have in our thoughts and our minds as we go through life Repentance. Repentance. It's how John the Baptist uh, started preaching. It's how Jesus started preaching. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, we also need a proper understanding of that. I like to teach with uh, opposites or this, what, what I think would be kind of opposite would be to reform. Um, and maybe not not a complete opposite because reforming or reformers also have change. They change. Repentance for sure means change. The difference though is that a reformer falls short of creating and producing a new life. They emphasize building on the old and changing it to the better. Let's read verse 38. One day some teachers of religious law and Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to show us a miraculous sign to prove your authority. But Jesus replied, Only an evil, adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But the only sign I will give them is the sign 
of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation on Judgment Day and condemn it, for they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. Verse 42, The Queen of Sheba will also stand up against this generation on Judgment Day and condemn it. For she came from a distant land to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Now someone greater than Solomon is here, but you refuse to listen. When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert seeking rest, but finding none. Then it says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds its former home empty, swept in order. Verse 45. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all enter the person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. That will be the experience of this generation. My emphasis largely will be on verse, on verse 43 and uh, 44. I, I see this message that Jesus was bringing out to the Pharisees as, well, we see what it says in verse 41, Nineveh condemns the Pharisees because of their repentance. The Pharisees, the Pharisees had an understanding of building upon an old system that was broke. That was their philosophy. That's just how they did things. Jesus came along and he preached repentance. So did his disciples and so did John the Baptist. Um, and, and it couldn't be understood because of their strong, deeply rooted idea of, of reforming just reforming, building on the law of Moses. I think that was the message directly uh, what Jesus was talking about. Now what I see in verse 43 is what kind of stirred my mind. To, I, I've read that wondering what really what that means or what can we draw from it. I'm sure there's numerous things we can draw from. Verse 43, as far as, you know, how these things work out in people's lives that accept the kingdom, but they don't go all the way, therefore their latter end becomes worse. Like it would have been, their, their end is, is worse than when before they even repented. But what I get, what I, another thing I got out of that was, Just um, maybe on the word empty so much. Just, just how that this, this spirit, th in this life there will be an evil spirit. Whether we, when we cast it out and we renounce sin and it leaves. Like it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's not the end of the story. If we, if we don't fill this vessel if we don't fill this temple of good things, uh, it will be worse with us than bef before when we were still in the world. That's what I see here. And I don't know that these Pharisees, they probably didn't get that message. And I didn't for a long time. But that's what I'm seeing here is that this evil spirit left, leaves a person. And that's good. If we renounce him, he will flee. He, he is the lesser God is greater. He will flee. But it's like Norman was saying that the crown is not promised for those that just get an evil spirit cast out. If we live another ten years of just careless living after I've been delivered from an evil spirit and we don't press in and enter into the kingdom of God, seven other spirits will find us. And it won't look nice. Um, 
back to the two words, repentance. Um, it, mean, it, it ultimately means change. And the best I can describe it is going to some nature object, and it is a chrysalis. Think of a chrysalis. I was just thinking of that this morning, trying to find a really good object to describe it as. The chrysalis that I've seen, uh, maybe some of you don't know exactly what I'm talking about, but just make, make a little family uh, um, project out of it. Find yourself a worm, hang it up in a jar, or put it in a jar, it'll hang itself up. It, it hangs up upside down like a J. And you'll see some changes going on. It'll become harder and harder. And this thing actually changes into a beautiful butterfly. But it has to die first. If repentance is understood as anything else, as dying, it's not true repentance. And another really neat thing about this object is that if you'll notice, the worm, at least the monarch butterfly, it will hang itself up upside down. Legs first, body hanging down in a J. How does the butterfly come back out? Reversed. What was the worm's what was the worm's head hanging down is not a butterfly's body or back part. What was the worm's back part now becomes the butterfly's head. That's my observation, at least in the one that we've seen. It might not be the same for every last one, but but <coughs> it's a complete change in in op in the object. In the looks, it's reversed, and and that's that's what Jesus, that's really what he came to preach. It is the entrance to the kingdom of God. But back to back to being empty, the the way that this will be with a person that uh, gets an evil spirit cast out, but he doesn't fill it. Um, think of the well there's numerous things I thought of um, the virgins the virgins would be a good example there were ten virgins well maybe we should just read it I think I got the reference written down here Matthew 25 ten wise, uh, five wise five foolish The kingdom of heaven will be like the ten bridesmaids who made their lambs, who took their lambs and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough oil for their lambs, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Now at midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridemaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were going to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the mar marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside, calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, Believe me, I do not know you. So you must watch, for you do not know the day or the hour he may return. That is the emphasis, to watch. But we can, we can learn... We can learn, too, from what did they do wrong and what did they do right. All ten of them did, did something that was good and right. They, they took their lamps and they went out. Um, right and good. But what was wrong was that the five of them 
we'll just have to imagine some things exactly what they were thinking, but it was it's probably fair to think that they they thought, well, we're going to be really frugal here, and we're going to not waste any oil. It'll be too heavy to carry if it take another gallon or whatever it, whatever they were short. And right at that moment, they might have looked like the wise ones. Looking at the other five that had this backpack of maybe two extra gallons, 14 pounds extra going on a trip, couldn't you just shit that and then have a lighter load? But the story turned around. Be these, these five ones that, that were wise, in their mind they knew that you know, we have to prepare for the tough stuff. We have to be ready for um, whatever comes. Winds or high waters. And like we heard this morning, if we, uh, if we think we stand, take heat lest you fall. I think that's probably what was lacking with those five that they thought they had it figured out right down to the last drop of oil that this is going to be enough. But... They were found empty, just short of reaching it. And that, that's something that we think we have to think about when we teach our children, when we structure our lives, make those wise decisions to prepare ourselves to meet our God. Um, repentance. Repentance. It is... I think it's safe to say, I wrote this down, that there is no one on this earth that was raised so good, so righteous, that they don't need this repentance. Um, like it's a, I think it's a danger for our young people that, that they don't fall, that we don't teach them to fall into just performing, just not ever totally forsaking and denying their old life. Being raised good, righteous, that's a blessing. That's something that I'm not taking away from that at all. That's very needed. A part of that is, is to structure them so that when they come to the age um, of accountability that they have a, a sure foundation to then serve their God. But but the caution, the only caution I'm, I'm having here is that we don't um, miss the point of repentance. Even in a, in a young child, like there's just a difference. Um, someone that has habitually been sinning for 20, 30 years and they repent of that. Um, that is so obvious. That's so crystal clear. And that's, that's a blessing. We need those things in the... We need to see those things. But it's a great blessing just to... just to also see, to see young people just come forward and be like, Daddy, Mom, I see my old life as old. I was a fussy, fussy, rebellious child. I don't want to be reformed. I want to, I want to repent. I want to truly repent. And and those two those two examples are really the same thing. They enter the same they enter the same kingdom. And and that's what um that's the point I'm trying to make is that no one in here or on, on this earth was raised so good that they don't need this. On the other hand, no one has been so bad or so wicked, even if they have sinned, you know, their habit was just sinning for 30, 40 years or longer. No one is so bad that they can't do this. Like this God, this Jesus that preached repentance, um, he, he, he said things like that in order to bind a strong man that owns a house, it, need, it takes someone stronger to, to bind him and then plunder his goods. And that's what, that's what he did. See, Jesus was being accused of being casting out demons by the spirit of the devil. 
And then he made that point saying that um, saying that someone to in order to, for someone to uh, destroy a man that has a strong house, you have to be it takes someone stronger to bind him and then go plunder his his goods. My point is that Jesus Jesus is greater. We can repent. Um, the world doesn't know anything about it. They they think of taking the old the old and building on it, reforming it, changing it, whatever it takes. Drugs, education, um, just, it's amazing. But I want to finish my thought on, on how important it is to realize that Jesus is the greater one. Um, that is in Matthew, Matthew 12. Maybe we should just read it so we get the the point Matthew 12 verse 22 well maybe I'll just go down and read from uh, 27 on down to 29 um and if I am in part by Satan, what about your own exorcists? They cast out demons too. So they will condemn you for what you have said. See, they were saying that they were saying that being that Jesus was casting out demons proves that he's a demon himself. Well, they themselves couldn't do these things. So Jesus took that and pointed it back at Adam. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. For who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man like Satan and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. Someone who could tie him up and then plunder his goods. And, and that happened. I believe that. Um, and I think that's an important part to understand as far as what happened. Um, what Jesus came to do, he entered, he entered the dark places where there was captives, and he bound the man that had captivated them for years. They were captivated, like humanity was captivated, and he uh, he went in there, and with with the power of God, he released them. There's a scripture somewhere about. Um, Having freed the captive. Does, does anyone have that somewhere? It's a. Um, okay. Okay, let's see. Let's see, I should have looked that. Looked at that some more. Anyhow, maybe someone can find that and then we can talk about that some more too. But, but it's just a very important part to understand that, that we really can have victory over sin. And back to the fact that the world doesn't know anything about this victory. Um, the way they deal with problems is with, like I said, drugs and trying to, trying to build on the old. And Jesus was against that. Um, he said that we uh, we are not to try to force new wine into old into old skins. It would burst the burst the old skins, and again, I think the latter part would be worse than than before you put any wine into it. So, what the world does, and I find this interesting. Especially because uh, we've been looking at uh, children with problems and children that need homes, and it's it's just quite a mess out there with children. And it's not just children. There's adults that have that are in this mess of mental problems, and uh, you know, 
some traumatic experience they have drives them into, you know, some bad behaviors. And the way the world treats that is, is just prescribing with being post-traumatic, uh, with a post-traumatic stress disorder, and then, and then that that equals this certain drug, Respiradon or a Advil or Ad I see them, but I don't can't really pronounce them. What it, what is so interesting about it is, like they they have this trust that this drug is going to fix it, and there they go and oh small amount, see what happens. Ah, oh, didn't change it. Bigger amount, didn't change it. Something else didn't change it. But what changed was that they got worse. I see it just in all these children that they, uh, people adopt them and they have some, they might have a post-traumatic stress disorder because of the big change or something. But what do they need? For sure not drugs that, that don't, don't help anything but make it worse. What, what I want to say is that, so I go... And I look at what the side effects are of this drug that they force on these children. And it is exactly the behavior that they have. So what good has the drug done? It just enhanced the problem that they have been having. Irrational behavior is one of the, dis the, of the side effects of a, of a drug. That, you know, the possible side effects, if you look it up. Well, that's the behavior of the child. I'm convinced it's because they give it to them, you know, because, but they, they just think this is what works. This is what, this is what it takes. And um, repentance. You can teach a child to repent. And at a very young age, they, they can understand that um, Jesus has the victory. He has the victory over bad habits, over sinful desires, um, and if you want to build them up, you can tell them that they have the they have the ability to choose. That's how you build up a child. You have the ability to choose to take up this thing that's been made available. You can call it the victory, or you can call it the the ability to overcome bad things. And if you do that, I, th I, think, I think that's the answer. But the world doesn't know anything about that, so they go to drugs. Can you just read it? Yeah, I think that's the one you're talking about. So that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their life were held in slavery or captive by the fear of death. Is that, is that yeah, right? yeah. I think that might even come from Isaiah somewhere, yeah. some, some prophecy or something. But, uh, yeah, that is what Jesus did when he came here. It's one of the, one of the things he did was, was unlock those doors of the, of the captives. What a blessing. And this thing is put at us as a choice. It's not something that we can inherit. That's why whether we've been habitually sinning for 30 or 40 years or whether we're a teenager that just, okay, I realize that um, I've been rebellious and I need to repent. It's, it's both of those have to choose. It's something you choose. That's my point. Um, I uh, would like to uh, I wrote down a few thoughts about Dwayne got me going last week a little bit when he talked about the shoe that was lost for the one of a nail and the, you know the horse horse that was lost the, um for the one of a nail, a shoe was lost, and for one of the shoe, the horse was lost. For the one of the horse, the battle was lost, all because of the one of a nail. And that's interesting. I think we can 
create our own thoughts through through all that and um, back to that this is a choice because we choose to repent repent now this this goes this goes I'd say maybe uphill because we choose to repent godly conscience is gained because godly conscience is gained there might be other words that would fit that just as good or better. Because godly conscience is gained, righteous conviction is established. Because righteous conviction is established, we obey the teachings of Jesus. Because we obey the teachings of Jesus, we enter the kingdom of God. All because we chose to repent. You know, when we think, when, when we do something, we first give it some thought. Like we we become conscious of it, I think, um, and, and maybe uh, maybe conscience and conviction could be maybe conviction could rightfully be uh, first. I don't really know, but but we come we become aware of it through conviction or conscience, and then it's our choice. You know, we might become conscious or convicted that the certain teachings of Jesus. Um, it's a life or death issue. It's something, if I don't do it, there's, there's, there's death involved. And so, that's what got me to, I think that's how, uh, how it can be, and that's how, um, that's the result or the product of repentance. It's really, uh, I think Peter had some of these thoughts too, Maybe we'll go to Second Peter chapter one, where he talks about how it adds up, you might say. Add to your faith virtue, virtue knowledge, knowledge temperance and brotherly love and brotherly kindness. Maybe we'll start reading there in Second Peter chapter one. Verse 3. I'll read this in the King James. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. My other version says, By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these things that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust and besides this give all diligence add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and has forgotten that he has perched, ha he was perched from his old sins. And then I have another one that fits that last verse, verse 9. For the lack of faith and godliness, blindness is developed. Because of blindness, we cannot see afar off. Because we cannot see afar off, we forget from where we were called from. All because of the lack of faith and godliness. Or you might might say Peter made that. Um, I mean, there is there is the the things that we choo choose in life add up to something. It produces and it and it evolves into something. If we uh, like we've seen in that first scripture that we that we read, 
Even a person that has an evil spirit casted out, um, and he might walk around in glory and, and all this, that looked an evil spirit was cast out year after year. He might have a celebration day about it. But that's all he does? All this time he's making this big story about him having been cast out an evil spirit. Right behind him, seven, seven others. They might be small or not so noticeable. Come in and destroy him. Because he chose to be puffed up about this miracle. Now on the other hand, if we were cast out an evil spirit, or he could use anything for an example, and we humble ourselves, and we see the goodness of God, and we see our undoneness, and God just simply called us and, and was good to us, we see that he lets the rain come on the just and the unjust, and we forget about this reward-minded stuff. We're just simple, um, unworthy servants doing our duty. Then I think it'll add up like Peter was talking about here. We will think about, uh, we will give all diligence to add to our faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness and brotherly kindness charity. Because it says, he says right there, if these things be in you and abound, they will make that you will neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But then, of course, it says what we already read, but if you lack these things, you're blind. You cannot see afar off. Some people are so full of themselves um, that it blinds them. We be, have to be careful in that. Um. <clears throat> I think I'll close it with uh, just continuing reading this scripture. Verse 11, For as an inheritance, for so an inheritance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, of our Lord and the Savior Jesus Christ. And then verse 12, Wherefore I will not be neglectant, neglectant to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. I'm just reading these things because I know these things aren't new for us. Um, these thoughts that I'm sharing. But they're as reminders that, that we remember and remember and not neglect these important parts of building up our faith. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you into remembrance, knowing that shortly I must be put off from of this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. I think I'll leave it at that. But uh, just, just remember, there is no one um, so good that he don't need this. And there's no one so bad that he can't do this. Repentance. If anyone has any thoughts to share or corrections to make, that'd be a blessing. Go ahead, Joseph. I heard somebody told me that the butterfly won't actually have wings that will work if you take it out of the chrysalis yourself. That the blood won't be forced through its wings like it will have no endowment of strength. I don't know if that's true or not. It is. Yeah. Okay. It is. Good point. Yeah. So you can't, I mean, it's kind of like, I guess the idea that you, 
don't let a person be too easy on themselves. Just let them str struggle and suffer through this. You know, you can't... And you can't alleviate another man's burden if he has to take it before God. There are many examples of uh, that. It, that is true. We have to struggle. I mean, in all in all creation, there's a big struggle, and it's for our good. I, I think that's an example that we do have to take. And, uh, and I also want to add that I've been really blessed with the messages, and uh, I had many thoughts, but um, the thought, just quickly, I guess, um, the part about us helping one another or rebuking one another and helping get over misunderstandings and uh, I think that's part of the uh, as, uh, if we go the second mile, it'll help us a lot to, uh, well, that will cover that, the second mile. If we can forgive far enough, that we can forgive beyond the first mile, but into the second mile, uh, that we can continue to walk in, in godly grace and in His will. But I also thought, on the other hand, uh, with even all the even with all the forgiving, it will not by no means clear the guilty. We cannot forget that either. That just because we're forgiving does not clear the guilty. And uh, we need to watch that ditch too. And that was a brand new thought for me to think that the persecutor does not realize he's a persecutor. I, I kind of like that. Um, He always thinks he's doing well and he's doing good. He's just God himself. Jesus said um, they will kill you and think they've done a favor. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, may God bless us. One of the big differences between repentance, repenting and reforming is repentance is a change of lordship where reforming is still just serving the same Lord but trying to, <coughs> trying to put a different form on it. <clears throat> repentance requires a complete, a complete change of, of, of lordship. <coughs> 